Welcome to the Boswell Virtual Event Series. Um, it is day 4,396 of us being in business. I'm Daniel Golden, the proprietor, and I am honored to introduce for the third time, Lawrence Baldessaro, the professor emeritus of Italian at UWM, the author of Beyond DiMaggio, Italian Americans in Baseball, Baseball Italian Style, and the uh, editor of the Ted Williams Reader. Um, his new book is, you know, I should have probably said, how do I pronounce this book right? Um, I think it's Tony Lazari. That's it. Could go either way. Um, <laughs> Yankees legend and baseball pioneer. He is in conversation with a very special guest, Tom Schieber. Um, Tom Schieber is um, the uh, lead curator for exhibits at the Cooperstown uh, baseball Hall of Fame. His exhibits have included, which I, by the way, I did visit on a cross-country trek, Moberg, Big League Spy, and one for the books, Baseball Records, and the stories behind them, as well as Babe Ruth, His Life and Legend. He has served the Society of American Baseball Research Board of Directors and founded and chaired Sabres Pictorial History Committee. It is an honor to have both of you tonight. Welcome to Boswell's while you're still at home. So... All right, thanks so much, Daniel, uh, for sponsoring this event. And thank you too for everything you do for uh, local and national writers. Uh, you do a great job. Um, before I turn it over to Tom, I wanna to add one brief note to his introduction because I know he's too modest to say this. But in 2018, the Society for American Baseball Research, Sabre, gave Tom the Chadwick Award which is given only to the most distinguished of baseball researchers. So not only am I delighted to have my friend with me tonight, I'm honored. So thank you so much, Tom, for being here. Uh, thank you, Larry, and the check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> I, just as you wrote, wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I really appreciate that. That's very sweet of you. Uh, listen, I am a baseball fan. I'm a fan of baseball history. I'm a fan of baseball research. And I'm a fan of Larry Baldessaro. So for everybody watching, if you're already a fan of Larry's, then great, you get it. If you're not, I'm giving you a fair warning. Be prepared to become a fan. Uh, now, we have lots to cover. I want to make sure we leave time for uh, to field some questions, uh, which we'll do at the end. Send your questions whenever you want to, but we'll, we'll handle them at the end. And uh, you can do that through the chat feature. Um, and let's just start off. What do you say, Larry? You, you, you ready? This All is set. this is not a quiz. There's no scoring at home here, so we're just going to go through and, and, and learn a little bit about uh, you and the book and Tony Lazari. First of all, I know your mother uh, was born in Italy. Your grandparents were all born in Italy. Your parents are baseball fans. You loved baseball. You loved playing ball. You're a good ball player. It doesn't take a real brain surgeon to connect the dots and figure out that you'd be interested in baseball and Italian ball players, But you took it to another level. You've conducted countless hours of interviews. You've researched tirelessly. Uh, you give it a lot of presentations. You've obviously already learned about the books that you've written, including this new one. Why, why, how is it that you went the extra mile? And specifically, what, what motivated you to write this particular book? Um, well, first about how I got to Italians in baseball generally, because, yeah, I grew up in an Italian family, all four grandparents, immigrants, my mother born in Italy. Uh, my grandmother would speak to me in Italian and her Abruzzese dialect, which I understood, but I'd always answer in English, because when I was a kid, we didn't want to be ethnic. It wasn't yet chic. We wanted to be American, even we really didn't know what that meant, but intuitively, once you're outside the home, you're at school and on the streets and so forth. So I didn't have a great sense of my ethnic identity. And that didn't really come around until I was in college and spent a summer in Italy, met my family there where my mother was born, discovered the art and culture of Italy. I fell in love with Italy and decided to get a PhD in Italian rather than English, where I thought I was headed. I've always loved baseball. So 
in the early 80s, I started writing about baseball, but not about Italians yet. And at some point, and I couldn't tell, give you an exact date, but you know, you said it doesn't take a, a brain surgeon, but it took me quite a while to suddenly think, I love baseball, I'm Italian. Why not write about Italian men? And I also realized that very little has been had been written about them. There was no book. So that's why I, I wrote that Beyond DiMaggio, the history of Italian Americans in baseball. So it took me a while to get there. As to why I wrote this particular book, the first line of my preface reads, before there was Joe DiMaggio, there was Tony Lazzari. Tony made his debut in 1926. Joe came along in 1936, 10 years later. And everybody knows who Joe DiMaggio was. He was a cultural icon of 20th century America. Sadly, most people don't remember who Tony Lazzari was. And I didn't know all that much about him myself. I had vague ideas, but it wasn't until I started doing the serious research for Beyond DiMaggio that I discovered this man. And of all the people I wrote about in that book, 500 plus pages, no one surprised me, no one intrigued me as much as Tony Lazzari, because I really had no idea what an important figure he was in the 20s and 30s that he was actually the leader of those great Yankee teams, Murderer's Row, who knew? So that's what got me started. And the more I researched, the more I understood what an incredible personality he was, his contemporaries praised him as not only one of the best players of that time, but also one of the smartest and the most respected. And in terms of popularity, he was second only to Babe Ruth as a popular Yankee at that time. So all of that stuff was just surprising and amazing to me. So I just want to read a couple of brief, brief excerpts of what was written about Luzeri by some of those contemporaries. Now, sadly, Tony died in 1946 at the age of 42. So right after he died, Red Smith, well, for those of you who don't know, Red Smith is one of the most distinguished sports writers of the 20th century and also one of the great prose writers of the 20th century. Right after Tony died, he wrote, Mazzari was as great a player as ever lived. In all his time with the Yankees, there was no one whose hitting and fielding and hustle and fire and brilliantly swift thinking meant more to any team. At that same time, Arthur Daly, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the New York Times wrote, Lazzari was a truly great performer, a tremendous long ball hitter, a money player almost without equal, and one of the smartest athletes ever to patrol the diamond. And finally, Ed Barrow, who was the Yankees general manager that signed Tony and probably knew him as well as anyone, in his 1951 autobiography wrote, his rightful place in baseball should be as one of the greatest Yankees of them all. So just to give you a sense of how exalted this guy was in his playing days. Um, the other thing, Lazari was also a pioneer in baseball. He was the first professional player to hit 60 home runs in one season. He was one of the first major leaguers to hit the in, middle infielders and in majors to hit with power. And he was the first major star in Major League Baseball of Italian descent, which as I'll talk about later, had a significant social impact. Um, and perhaps the most remarkable thing about Luzeri is that he accomplished all of this while dealing with the daily challenge of living with epilepsy. It seems impossible that he could have done that, to have those reflexes, that timing in it. But um, I mean, if he were playing today, he'd probably be celebrated as a role model, you know, a, an inspirational story for those who are living with epilepsy of what they can accomplish. Right. But in those days, epilepsy was so stigmatized that it was best to keep it quiet. In fact, the fans never knew uh, of Tony's affliction. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, and we'll talk more about, about that because it's, it's, uh, it's, pretty stunning 
it's stunning what he did given given uh, that challenge. Um, I think what you, you sort of summarize here in, in, in a way is that from today's viewpoint, Tony Lazaro is kind of a surprising guy. I mean, he surprises people because he kind of flies under the radar a little bit. I mean, listen, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, he's a great ball player. And yet somehow he's not talked about as much. He's overlooked. Now, um, I know, I, once again, I'll say it. Read the book, folks. You'll, you'll understand what, what uh, uh, Larry's talking about. And, and you'll, you'll understand uh, what makes him great. But I uh, yeah. say this one more point that um, I felt when I discovered some of these things about him, like I had found some buried treasure of baseball history. I couldn't understand how someone who's so exalted in his time has disappeared from the radar screen of baseball. And that's when I realized that the, his story is too important not to be told in, in detail and uh, put into historical context. And that's really what got me going. Yeah. Well, listen, one of the reasons, and we've talked about this before, Larry, one of the reasons he's been overlooked, or he may not, overlooked might not be the right word in this particular case, but he has not been appreciated as much, is because of the elephant in the room. We're gonna talk about the elephant in the room here, which is, you know, baseball is an amazing sport, but there's this bizarre, cruel balance in baseball. For every hero, there's a victim, for every moment of triumph, there's tragedy. For every Kirk Gibson, there's a Dennis Eckersley. For every Pete Alexander, there's a Tony Lazzari. So let me set the scene, and, let, and then I want you to take it from here. Game seven of the 1926 World Series, the Yankees are up three games to two, but they're trailing. Uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the series is tied, right? It's 3-3. Three, three. And, the, and the, uh, the, oh wait, it's just game six. It's game six or game seven. Todd, you correct me on this one, Larry. What was that? We, uh, which game are we on, on in this? Seven. This is, game seven. Game seven, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so the yep. series is tied. Game. Series is tied, but the but the Yankees are uh, trailing the Cardinals in, in game seven, three to two. And Jesse Haynes is a starting pitcher for the Cardinals, great Cardinal pitcher. Gets into trouble. The bases are loaded. There's two outs. Take it from here. And Tony Zeri, Zeri comes to bat. And... He's 22 years old, he's a rookie. And uh, if he gets a hit, he'll at least tie the game. He might put the Yankees ahead, they might win the World Series and he'd be the great hero. Um, as he comes up to bat, Rogers Hornsby, the player manager, calls in from the bullpen, Rover Cleveland Alexander, 39 years old, 22 year old rookie. Rover Cleveland Alexander was already known as one of the great pitchers of all time. He was one of the first nine men to go into the Hall of Fame. He had something like 333 wins in his pocket when he walks in from that bullpen to face this 22-year-old rookie, who, by the way, I'll tell you more about his records later, but one record he did set in uh, 1926, he led the American League in strikeouts with, 20, with 96, more than Babe Ruth. So it's a weird matchup, as Tom is describing, they got somebody's going to be a winner, somebody's going to be a loser. <clears throat> it's a one-one count, and Alex throws a fastball inside. Tony swings and hits a drive to left field that, at first, looks like it's going over the fence. <clears throat> it's going to be a grand slam. The Yankees are probably going to win. Just at the last second, it hooks foul. So now the count is one and two, and. The old veteran Alex comes back and throws a low outside curveball <clears throat> that Tony can't resist. He swings and misses, and that's the end of the threat. But that's the seventh inning. The Yankees still had two more innings to go, and Alex shut them down, and that was it, three to two. Now, <clears throat> the question is, why is Tony Lazeri remembered if for one thing, that strikeout? He went to bat more than 6,000 times. He set a lot of records. He was a great player. He's in the Hall of Fame. And yet this one swing of the bat in this haunted him for the rest of his life. Why has that become such an iconic moment in World Series history? No one would have guessed that at the time because nobody blamed Lazeri. Nobody said he was the GOAT. After all, 
he was he's led the league in strikeouts. He's facing Grover Cleveland now. What are the odds? So no writers blamed Lazari whatsoever. <clears throat> the fault went to uh, Koenig, the shortstop, and Musil, the center fielder, who made two errors in the fourth inning that allowed all three unearned runs to come in, and that was the difference in the game. So why has this moment stayed in everybody's mind? Well, I think there are two reasons. Tom might have more. For one thing, it was Grover Cleveland Alexander. If it had been any other pitcher, any average reliever or starter, who would remember this? But it was Grover Cleveland Alexander, iconic moment. Second, if you go to the Hall of Fame and you go and see Alexander's plaque, it will say, won the 1926 World Championship by striking out Tony Lazari in the final crisis. And Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's the only time a person and player is named on a plaque for a failure. So the Hall of Fame opened in 1939, and Alex was one of the first to be inducted. Everybody who's walked through the Hall of Fame, the gallery, and seen that plaque is reminded of one thing. He struck out Tony Lazari. Right. Right. And, and you know, the other part is that, that uh, uh, he wouldn't be mentioned on that plaque if, it's, if, it, had been, if it had been, you know, uh, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, let's let's say uh, Pat Collins, who's a, a backup catcher, or, yeah. or Ben Pascal. You, they wouldn't mention these guys on the plaque because eh, what's the big deal about the you know nothing against these, these major leaguers, but what's the big deal about striking this guy out? But and as you mentioned at the time, it wasn't uh, talked about like it is now. But it's talked about like it is now because after his rookie season, which was a great season, was there he continued to have a great career, and so now. In hindsight, here's a great player who struck out in the clutch, you know. But and the other thing that, that that that's interesting is, you know, we think of these powerhouse Yankees, and they've won more World Championships than, than any other major league team. But at this time in 1926, they had one World Championship to their name. There's, I don't want to diminish how well, how great they were. They're a great team. They're, but but by that time, all they had was 1923 World Championship. So they're not the powerhouse Yankees that we know of now. Well, in uh, fact, in 1925, before Lazari came up, they finished in seventh place. Yeah, that was a tough year, right? <laughs> that was a tough year. Wonderful. Listen, let's talk. Let's let's roll it back a little bit before 26, his rookie year. Tell me a little bit more about about his background before he became a big league ball player, growing up right. in San Francisco. Well, Lazari was a son of Italian immigrants. Um, he was born in December 6, 1903. His parents had only arrived in America nine months before he was born. He lived in apparently what was a pretty tough neighborhood in the Potrero district because he told the writer later on, he said, this wasn't a neighborhood where you were likely to grow up a sissy because it was always fight or get licked, and I never got licked. And in fact, he became an amateur boxer, even contemplated becoming a professional. Fortunately for him and for us, he devoted his passion to baseball. And he was an outstanding athlete as a kid um, in San Francisco on the Sandlots. Joe Cronin, who was a fellow San Franciscan and went on to be a Hall of Fame shortstop, he was only two years younger than Tony, but he idolized him because he said Lazari was the kid who always scored the winning goal in a soccer match who scored the winning touchdown in a football game and who got the hit to win the baseball game. So he was a very talented uh, young athlete. He left school when he was 15 years old and he went to work in the same ironworks factory where his father was working. And he always attributed that labor to building up the strong wrists and forearms that enabled him ultimately to hit all those home runs he would hit. Um, so he was playing sandlot ball and excelling. And someone got word to the manager of the Salt Lake City Bees in the Pacific Coast League, who was former major league outfielder for the Red Sox, Duffy Lewis. So they checked him out. And uh, the end of the 1921 season in, in sandlot ball, semi-pro ball, 
he was signed by the Salt Lake City Bees. Now, the Pacific Coast League at that time was double A, which was the highest minor league ranking. And there were only three leagues in the country that had that. So Tony Lazzari, next year, 1922, is playing one step below Major League Baseball. Well, there's a reason why I titled this particular chapter, The Agony and the Ecstasy, because the first year was a lot of agony. He only got into 45 games, hit 192. So he clearly was out of his league, literally. So the next season, 23, they shipped him off to Peoria, Peoria Tractors in the 3I League, Class B. So he'd get more experience. He got off to a slow start, but he did okay by the end of the season. In 1924, he's back with the Bs. But a couple of months into the season, they said, yeah, he needs more, more work. So they ship him off to the Lincoln Lynx in the Western League, Class A. And this is where he bloomed. He ended up hitting 44 home runs for Lincoln, became a huge fan favorite. Um, so now it's 1925. He spends the whole season with Salt Lake City. And he puts on one of the most impressive offenses, perform offensive performances in the history of organized baseball. Now, granted, they played a lot of games in the Pacific Coast League, and he played in 197 games that season. He hit 355, and he hit the 60 home runs. Never been done. Babe Ruth hit 50, 59 in 1921, which is the first time somebody reached the 60 plateau. And he drove in 222 runs. And those two records, home runs and RBIs, remain to this day, almost a century later, still the PCL records. Now, in spite of that incredible performance, Major League teams didn't come flocking to sign Tony Lazzari. Why not? Well, a couple of reasons. One, and some certain teams admitted this, they wouldn't sign him because he was an epileptic. They didn't trust it. Uh, the other reason was there's some skepticism about hitting big in the Pacific Coast League because there have been other sluggers who had done really well in the PCL and then faded out in the majors. But the other reason was he was Italian. At that time, only 15 major leaguers, clearly of Italian descent, had ever played in the majors. So they weren't signing them in bunches. And I just want to read um, Lee Monfield in his biography of Babe Ruth wrote, but other teams stayed away because Lazzari was Italian, a minority not in favor of the white old line managers of the game. And there were a lot of baseball historians have written about that kind of bias in that era. Well, the Yankees too were skeptical. So, but they decided to send Ed Barrow, the GM, send three scouts out to check out Lazzari. One of them went to San Francisco and he discovered that Lazzari seemed to only have epileptic seizures in the morning, all right? Um, and another one of the scouts said to Barrow, he says, I don't care what he has, sign him. He's the greatest thing I've ever seen. So in August of 25, Salt Lake City buys Lazeri's contract for $50,000, which was a huge sum in those, and five players. So. Now he's on his way to the Yankees. Yeah, and I think it's neat that you point out that the uh, how people kind of look askance at what the numbers really mean coming out of the Pacific Coast League. And, so, and, I, and I think Lazzari is pioneer not only as, a, as an Italian-American, but in a, a pioneer in terms of like, no, you know, obviously there's more games played, but there's something to these guys. So when DiMaggio comes along, you know, and they sign him up, you know, he burns up the, the PCL and he has he has a 61 game hitting streak in the Pacific right. Coast League. So when he comes to it really isn't. I mean, it's amazing that he had 56 straight games in the majors, but it's not really a surprise that DiMaggio was this incredible clutch. I mean, about, about as clutch as you can get player uh, and heroes for a personal record. He's, he's a clutch guy. And so so Lazari actually paved the way for, hey, you know what? The Pacific Coast League don't just count the numbers out of hand. Uh, so I think that's that's really neat. Uh, now, as far as being a, 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 a 
turns out to be a, a hero for Italian Americans and a man who overcame anti-Italian sentiment, which is a big deal at that time. I want you to talk about that. But I mean, what what was it about Lazzari and not, let's say, a, a predecessor like uh, a, a Italian American, like a Ping Bodhi or Babe Pinelli? What was it about Lazzari that made him great and, made, and, and set him apart? Well, neither of those two that you mentioned, Babe Pinelli or Ping Bodhi, had great careers, obviously. They were pretty good. They had several years career, but nothing approaching was airy. Um, what set him apart was, first of all, that he was a middle infielder, a second baseman. By the way, in his rookie year, he had played shortstop almost exclusively in the minor leagues. When he got to the Yankees in 26, Miller Huggins, the manager, converted him to a second baseman. So he's facing all the other questions about, can I succeed as a rookie? Am I worth the $50,000? Can I, how can I repeat what I did last year? So there's a lot of pressure on him. And it would be understandable if a 22 year old rookie collapsed under that pressure. Uh, he had never even seen a major league ball game. And here he is in the starting lineup of the Yankees with Babe Ruth. Well, let's start at the beginning. He didn't collapse. He zoomed right to the top as a rookie. Now he hit 18 home runs. You're gonna say 18 versus 60 the year before. It's not too great. Well, in 1926 in the American League, that was good enough for third place. Babe Ruth, of course, walloped everybody, 47 home runs. The runner up was Milwaukee native, Al Simmons with 19 home runs and Rosario was third with 18. And perhaps even more impressive, Rosario was second in the league in RBIs, 117, which was a rookie record at the time and second only to Babe Ruth. So he gets off to this tremendous start. And except then for the World Series, which he discussed in the thing with Alexander, but for a rookie to do what he did was amazing. The other thing I think that, that set him apart was not just because he went on for the next four years to do these amazing things. I mean, he 27, he was better. 28, he was hurt, but he still had a great year. He was third in the MVP vote. 29 was his best career overall. So he gets off to this great start. So he's proven himself as a player, fine. But I think what really sets Lazari apart is that as a 22 year old rookie, he was recognized as the leader of this great Yankees team. Team that won the pennant, almost won the World Series. And then in 27, went on to become one of, if not the greatest team of all time, the murderous row. Lazari is the leader of that team, not Ruth, not Gary. How does a rookie manage to do that? In those days, rookies weren't welcomed into spring training camp. They were seen as a threat. If I'm a veteran and this punk kid from San Francisco is coming up here, he might take my job. And there were no guaranteed contracts. It was year to year. So rookies were to be seen, not heard, and you know, stay in your place, take care of things, and that's it. There had to be something exceptional about Lazari, some aura of leadership, of authority, that not only was he well-liked by his teammates, they didn't scorn him, he was well-liked, and he becomes the guy they all turn to when there's a tough point in the game. Yeah. And to just emphasize this point, let me read a couple of other brief comments from that 1926 rookie year and Ed Barrow, again, the general manager, said of Lazari, he said, he was the making of that ball club, holding it together, guiding it, and inspiring it. Lazari had a brilliance on the ball field that was part mental and part instinctive. And Frank Graham, who was the beat writer for the New York Sun covering the Yankees at the time and later wrote an important history of the Yankees, said of Lazari, Mazzari had the poise of an old stager and a wisdom that must have been born in him. The other players who for so long had looked to Ruth to lead them 
Now we're looking to this amazing busher. And finally, even an umpire, even an umpire said this, Tommy Conley, who was then the Dean of American League umpires, going back to 1901, he says, I know I shouldn't be saying this as an umpire, he said, but this Italian is one of the greatest ball players I ever saw. He's all baseball, and when he opens his mouth, everybody on the club pays attention, including the big guy in right field, meaning Babe Ruth. Yeah. So I think these are the things that set him apart. Apart from this great playing ability, exceeding expectations as a rookie and for the first several years, but also having this built-in leadership, whether he got it on the streets of San Francisco, working in the factory, who knows. But again, he was always considered one of the smartest baseball men. He had a brilliant baseball mind. So put all those things together, and you have this, to me, incredibly phenomenal thing of a, who ever heard of a rookie of any age? coming in and being the leader of any ball club. Right. I, to me, it's amazing. It, yes. And th th once again, it, it's, it's one of these surprising things about, about Lazeri that, that somehow has been lost over time. And it makes it even more surprising. I, I, let's, let's talk about this a little bit more because he has, it's almost like it's a, it doesn't make sense. He's got this complex personality where he's, He's actually a very quiet guy, maybe even at times even shy, and yet he's feisty. The guy, as you mentioned, he's a former boxer. Uh, he's a prankster. So, it, you know, clubhouse guy, he uh, uh, fits in immediately and is uh, a, f a fun guy. As you mentioned, a something in innate about his leadership that's almost like, um, I don't know if charisma is the right word. It, there's, a, I think, a magnetism maybe mm -hmm. of, about him. Very popular. How is it possible? How is this possible that you get a guy this complex uh, and, and almost working against one another, quiet and yet and yet feisty? Um, it, it, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Well, it's a, it's a question I ask myself throughout writing the book, and still ask myself because it just, it doesn't make sense. Um, and we don't know a lot about Lazeri. Even, even Lazeri's grandson, Matt, told me when I went out to Oregon and looked through the scrapbooks that Lazeri's father had put together, Matt said, there's a lot we don't know about my grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> and that's true. Um, the, the famous quotation about Lazeri and how quiet he was Nobody's known knows anymore who first said it. But one writer said, trying to interview Tony Lazeri is like trying to mine coal with a comb and a nail file. That's how he's quiet. The press right from the start, he's quiet, he's laconic. Um, yeah, but he wasn't aloof because again, he became close friends with his teammates and as different in personality as two people could be, he and Babe Ruth were close friends. How do you explain that? Right. right. And there's just something unique about this man that it was really hard to pin down. Why was he so popular with the fans? Again, other than Babe Ruth, he was the most popular Yankee of that whole era. And how do you explain that? Because he didn't have Ruth's eccentricity, his larger than life persona. He's sort of a blue collar worker going at his job at second base and playing it really well. But I think part of the reason that he appealed to fans so much, he was a very modest person. The year he was playing in Salt Lake City with the Bees and hit the 60 home runs, the kid who was the bat boy many years later told the reporter for the Los Angeles Times, the Salt Lake City fans adored Tony. He made them love him because of his modesty. So there must have been something in the New York fans and American fans in general that appealed to this guy who had such great talent, extraordinary talent. Uh, they must have known he was the leader of the team and yet he was very modest and shy. In yeah. fact, if you'll uh, indulge me for another moment here, if I can find uh, these quotations. Um, about his personality that I wanted to point out. Yeah, Frank Graham, who I 
quoted earlier, described Luzeri as sensitive, thoughtful, and shy. Paul Gallico was one of the major sports writers of the 1920s, said, there was a gentleness about Tony Luzeri and a warmth that was appealing and endearing. Okay, but as Tom pointed out, there's another side to Luzeri, he was a fierce competitor. So the same Paul Gallico, who writes about his gentleness and warmth, also wrote this, Tony is all temperament, fire, fight and push, a natural competitor and a natural born ball player. So all these, these again, he had this great sense of humor. One of his teammates, uh, Sad Sam Jones said, Tony was a quiet guy, but full of fun. He was always up to something. Usually what he was up to was pulling pranks on his teammates and keeping the locker room loose. You know, sometimes, sometimes it takes, um, when, you're, when you're a modest, quiet person, then that contrast helps. So if you're modest and quiet, but when you speak, people know there's something to be said here. Or you're modest and quiet and you play a joke, it's a better joke from a modest, quiet guy than a guy who's constantly goofing off. So maybe that contrast actually maybe the quietness actually accentuates the importance of what he said or the or or the seriousness of his task yeah neat i want to take a step back because i had a question that I, I i noted down i forget to forgot to get to which was when we we're talking about his pre-major league days and how he was having troubles and a bunch he, he goes to lincoln and and that's really the turning point what what do you think it was that what clicked what, what happened in Lincoln, of all places, Lincoln, Nebraska, that just clicked? Is it just a matter of it, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back? He just needed more and more experience? Or do you think there was something special that, that occurred there? I never found anything that pointed to that particularly. Or the Cleveland that did, uh, um, Lincoln did this that he hadn't done elsewhere. Yeah, I think partly, don't forget, he, he was a very free swinger which is why he led the league in 26 with 96 strikeouts. So I think part of it was a matter of, you know, he must have been an even wilder swinger. In fact, when Barrow sent those scouts out, one of them did point out this, you know, he's got to learn the strike zone. So clearly he must have had something uh, that improved in, in Lincoln in terms of pitch recognition or whatever it might be that really took him to another level. The other thing, you know, before he went to Lincoln, the Bees were going to send him to the Eastern League. And he refused the assignment. It looked like he was going to quit because he was so frustrated. He was sent down in the first, the second year. Now he's sent down in the, in the 1924 again. It's like they said, I can't take this. It didn't last long. Within a week or so, he changed his mind. And that's when they signed him at Lincoln. So it was, he would have ended up somewhere in the Eastern League, uh, but instead he's in the Western League with Lincoln. And what it was that clicked suddenly, I, I have no good answer for that, but boy, 44 home runs. And that's, he was, he was in with the Salt Lake in the 25 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's fantastic. Um, Lazari had obviously the moment that, that is unfortunately haunt, haunted him for the rest of his life with striking out in the 26 World Series in a critical moment. But of course, he's on mo many more world championship teams. Um, but let's talk about some of the highlights of his career. I, I got a, a few that I want to mention and want to get your take on. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the, the 1936 Yankees and specifically on May 24th at Shy Park in Philadelphia, Lazari had a game for the ages. I mean, he had, he had uh, uh, four hits, three of them are home runs, of which two are grand slams. He's the first guy in Major League Baseball, as far as anyone knows, that hit uh, two grand slams in one game. We're still doing research into the history of the early Negro League, so I don't know. But in terms of American and National League, the first, definitely the first guy to do that. 11 RBIs in a single game, that's still an American League record. What are we, how many years later are we here, 80 four years later or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's still an American League record. And what I love is that he did this batting eighth, eighth. in the order. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, an amazing game. 
Um, how, how does one do that batting eighth? You got to get a lot of guys on base. <laughs> I mean, timing is everything, right? You just happen to come up twice, the first two times up, and the bases were loaded, and he hit one out. Like, see, a solo home run, a triple, 15 total bases. I mean, and he, he always said, of course, that that was his single highlight of his career. And how could it not be? Yeah. Although the one thing he did that neither Ruth nor Gehrig ever did in 1932, and they hit, an, he hit a cycle is when you hit in the same game, a single, double, triple, and home run. But then you have a natural cycle in which you do those things in succession. First the single, then the double, and end up with the home run. And that's pretty rare itself, the natural cycle, right, Tommy? I mean, you don't see that every year. But here again is where Lazari stands out. His home run to cap that cycle was a grand slam. <laughs> Nobody had ever done it before. Nobody has done it since. A natural cycle finished with a grand slam. That's awesome. And you've got the pressure. Obviously, the triple is the hardest part of the cycle. Yeah. But, but nevertheless... You got, especially in this era where a home run is a bigger deal, you've you've got the, the the single, double, triple out of the way. You got the bases loaded, and you know you you're thinking about your team. Of course, you want to do what's right for the team, but you're also in the back of your mind going, "If I can just lift this a little bit, <laughs> it'll be awesome." Yeah, fantastic. And and so at the thirty, I think it talks about a lot how great that thirty six team was that you could bat eighth. Oh yeah, and 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 get two grand slams. I mean, the guys have to be on the bases to do that. What's fun about the 36 team and, and the 30 set, 37 Yankees as well is Lazeri's not the only Italian-American on the team. Not anymore. 1932, Frank Crosetti, another San Francisco native. Almost all the major uh, Italian-American major leaguers in the early years through the 30s were from the San Francisco area such a hotbed of amateur baseball. So Frank Crosetti comes along and becomes the double play combination with Lazeri starting in 32 and it, until Lazeri leaves the Yankees after 37. And then in 1939, we're jumping ahead here, but then Joe DiMaggio comes along. It's the first time there are three Italian Americans in the starting lineup of any major league team. With a, that 36 season, Lazeri was so good that the New York chapter of the Baseball Writers Association named him the Major League Player of the Year in 1936, which is the second last year of his whole career with the Yankees. And one of the fascinating things about Lazari's career, it doesn't follow, say, the typical bell curve where you start out slow, you reach a peak maybe 28, 29, and as the years pass, you maybe slide down the hill. No. Zeri zoomed to the top his first year, second, third, fourth year. He was so good at that point that one writer said that if this keeps up, Zeri will be remembered as one of the all-time greats, along with Ty Cobb, Honus Wagner, Rogers Hornsby, and Babe Ruth. That's how good he was. Yeah. However, 1930, the year after he has his greatest season, he goes into this prolonged slump. His power numbers drop, his batting average drops from 354 to 303, which isn't bad, but that's a precipitous drop. He comes back strong in the last month of the season, so his numbers don't look horrible. But everybody was wondering, what's happened to this 27 years old, considered one of the strongest men in baseball, and all of a sudden he's in this prolonged slump. It got worse in 1931. He had the worst year of his career. He was on the bench for a lot of the, a lot of the games. Nobody could understand what happened to this guy. Mm -hmm. And there were no reports of injuries. Then after the 31 season, he bounces back and has a really good year in 32, another really good year in 33. And 34, 35, he slides back down a little bit. And as Tom point, he comes back in 36. as another great year. How do you explain that? There was no report of any injury, especially in that 30, 31 period when he was so bad. 
But then I started seeing these vague references to an illness. And one writer said, Tony's now in his 12th year as a professional ball player, but his health isn't always good. Well, what does that mean? Well, it seems to me that the logical possibility, I'm not gonna say conclusion, but possibility is that his epilepsy interfered. Now, epilepsy, you can have periods where there are really good times when you're not having many, if any, seizures. And then there are really bad times when more seizures and more intrusive. And that can give you tired, sore muscles, <clears throat> fatigue, and less mental focus. And all of those things, if you think about it, would help you understand why this strong young man suddenly falls off the cliff. Because it was so bad, by the end of the 31 season, there were all kinds of trade rumors. The Yankees are going to trade Lazari for a starting pitcher. Some writers even said, he's at the end of his career. He's done. At 28. So how do you explain then the fact that he bounces back and gets great again, slides off a little bit, and then comes back again? So this wave, it seems to me the logical possibility, which no one would talk about publicly, was that he had stronger seizures, more seizures, than probably having to take more medication, which would have been phenobarbital, and that can slow down, you know, your reflexes. Yeah. Facing major league pitching, how do you do that? So I have no other explanation, but a plausible explanation, it seems to me, is that epilepsy did interfere with him in those years. No way to prove it definitively. Yeah, yeah. It's a, as you mentioned early on, it's a different time as how uh, epilepsy was dealt with than it is today. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's a very difficult issue. Um, just, uh, I think we'll do a, one more uh, thing, uh, topic I want to cover, and then let's, let's uh, take it to the uh, questions that have been coming in. Um, the last chapter of the, your bio is called Legacy. So what is it that you think that the readers should remember about Tony Lazari? Well, what, what I hope readers take away from the book is that there was much more to Tony Lazari than, um, you know, being a great baseball player and winning five World Series rings. Um, there was a lot of depth to this person, as we've talked about, complex personality, but beloved by both his teammates, even opposition players like Tony. Um, the newspapers, right, loved him, even though he didn't talk to them much because he was so quiet. But again, he had that, that appeal. Um, the thing that's really overlooked about Tony Luzeri, oh, finally, is apart from his baseball greatness, <clears throat> is a significant social role. As the first major star in major leagues of Italian descent, he created an entirely new fan base because Italian immigrants, great majority, didn't care about baseball. They thought it was a waste of time. They just discouraged their kids from playing, especially <clears throat> if they wanted to become professionals. I mean, one of the old timers I spoke to said, I told my father I wanted to play professionally. <clears throat> he says, you're going to become a bum. It was unimaginable you could make a living playing this game. So here comes Tony Lazari. Now you have to put this, when he came along <clears throat> in historical perspective, 1926, he's a rookie. Two years before, in 1924, Congress passed an Immigration Act that strictly limited the number of immigrants who could come from Southern and Eastern European countries, like Italy, Greece, Poland, etc. There was so much anti-immigration bias at that time that you had this national law that almost totally locked the gates to these immigrants. So that's the atmosphere in which Tony Lazari became a major league ball player. And who was the most famous American of Italian descent in 1926? 
Say it with me, Al Capone. <laughs> so there you've got that great stereotypical image that still exists today about Italians, mafia, gangsterism, et cetera, et cetera. Tony Luzeri comes in in the middle of this and he becomes a hero, the leader of the greatest team in baseball, the most successful team in baseball. And now you've got national coverage of baseball. Media coverage was exploding at that time about sports, particularly baseball, which really ruled the world of sports at that time. Here comes Tony Lazzari, son of immigrants, who's a hero and leader of this team. And that gives these Italian Americans something to be proud of. Here's one of our own who's being cheered and admired by millions of Americans. Here's our hero. So he instilled in them a sense of pride that it was difficult for them to have given those times. No less important was, I think, the impact Tony had on the way others perceived Italians. Because he was such a great player, idolized by countless Americans as one of the great players, and his, he was praised as much for his character and his intellect as he was for his playing ability. So I think with his work ethic, his modesty and his leadership ability, I think he did, and I think I can say this with some hope of certainty, I believe he did more than anyone before him to counter all those negative stereotypes that had been in the public consciousness since the 1880s. And he did more by doing that to enhance the general perception of Italian Americans than anyone before him. Yeah, I mean, you, you think he had, he had a lot to overcome, right? We've talked about probably the most stunning being the epilepsy. But he's, and then we also talked about the fact that he, whether consciously or not, had to fight what, what ends up being an anti Pacific Coast League uh, bias. Yeah. <laughs> That's like, right. <laughs> and then on top of that, the anti Italian American feelings at that time, which is like the perfectly wrong time with Al Capone's power. So that's a lot to overcome. Um, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Let's let's get some questions from from the uh, that have been coming in okay. from the, the audience here. Um, and this actually relates a little bit to, to what uh, you were just talking about, Larry. Uh, John is wondering if Lazari embraces Italian heritage given that racism. How, how was it that he how did he relate to his own Italian American heritage? That's a question I really can't answer with any clarity or certainty because he spoke so little about himself. Now I yeah. do know that at one point um, he and I think Crosetti became members of the Sons of Italy club in maybe the Boston area or something. Mm. But frankly, that's the only immediate connection I saw. Now, he was feted by the Italian-American community. In 1927, his second year, he had become such a hero that in New York City, Boston, and Detroit, they had Tony Lazzari days at the ballpark. And that night, huge banquets. They had over 1,000 people in New York City at a banquet for Tony Lazzari, 23-year-old kid, shy kid. And I mean, he suddenly became this tremendous hero. I don't think he was comfortable in that role because he was so modest and probably, you know, he was partly quiet because of the, the secret of epilepsy. So I can't imagine that he embraced that role as the image of the Italian Americans on the positive side. Um, so I can't really answer uh, how much of an, identity he had because you know he was constantly throughout his career and this was common lingo at the time portrayed in the press as a mwap one of the favorite terms they had for him sporting news after he had his first home run in spring training in 1926 they called him the walloping wop and then he would be called the dago now those terms appeared even in the new york times in those days it wasn't yet taboo but still, it, you know, that must have made him feel uneasy. 
And by the way, you know, his famous nickname, Push Him Up Tony Lazari, he admitted later that he never liked that because clearly it's a little condescending. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually someone asked about that about that nickname. Maybe you can flesh it out a little bit more. He got that pretty early, right? It was in Salt Lake City. There was a restaurant owner named Cesare Rinetti. And he took a liking to Tony. He was a baseball fan. So we would have Tony and his wife, May, come to the restaurant. He was sort of like a father figure, treated them really well. And according to the Salt Lake paper, he was at a game one day. And Tony comes up and he stands up and he yells, Push him up, Tony, whether he meant hit a home run or whatever. But that was the next day in the new Salt Lake City paper. That was a headline. And the editor, the sports editor who wrote that, went on using that kind of fake dialect about push him up, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And the fans started chanting in Salt Lake City. And it stuck with him when he went to the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. Let me... We got a question that's a little bit more broad than just Tony Lazari, and that, but it sets a, it, it, it helps talk a little bit about Lazari's background in the Bay Area, which is what was it about San Francisco that there's such a community of Italian Americans? Well, San Francisco drew a lot of different ethnic groups uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. The Italians were the last of the major ethnic groups to settle there, but um, there was a cosmopolitan air to San Francisco particularly that you wouldn't find or didn't find at that time in large American cities, which had a lot of Italians living in sort of ghetto-like settings and tenement buildings and so forth. And because there were so many of them, they were perceived often as threats to take somebody's job or corrupt the American way of life. You didn't have much of that. In fact, it was a very vibrant Italian community in San Francisco. They had an opera house, they had Italian language newspapers. It was really quite sophisticated. And one indication, a quick story about the difference. When Lazzari applied in 1941 to become a, he was a passionate golfer and a very good golfer. He and his wife had moved into back into the city and he applied for membership at the Olympic Club which was one of the most exclusive country clubs in the country. Yep. And they welcomed him with open arms. That was in 1941. A decade later, Yogi Berra and Dom DiMaggio, two of the most respected players in the majors and po popular and great at that time, both were blackballed when they applied to country clubs, one in New Jersey and one in Massachusetts. So there's the difference between San Francisco and the East Coast Italian experience. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Peter asks, do you have a favorite story shared by a family member uh, that you discovered in your research? Well, just related to golf. Again, his grandson, Matt said, you know, he loved golf. Tony played a lot of golf. He even started a uh, tournament at his home club in Millbrae when they lived south of the city for a while. And he created a tournament for professional baseball players, which then turned into a fundraiser. There wasn't time to get into his charitable work, but it, Tony was a very charitable person. Well, Matt told me that in order to train in the off season, he put these lead linings in his golf shoes so that when he walked around the course, he was getting a workout. And I thought that was pretty cool. I'd never heard of anybody doing that. So that was his way of uh, preparing in the off season. It's, it, it's a, uh, a great way for a good golfer to get a workout because the bad golfers are getting a workout without the lead. So right. you, know, <laughs> you, know, you got to be a pretty good golfer to, to have to pull that off. Uh, Steve says the way that you described Tony Lazari, he sounds a lot like Derek Cheater, which he, Steve says he, may, he means this as a compliment. What do you think about if the 27 Yankees uh, could be a comparison, you, you could compare Ruth Gary and Lazari to Judge Voigt and Labor Torres. What do you think of this comparison? Uh, not much, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Jeter was a great ball player, obviously, Hall of Famer. Um, and he had, I think, some of those 
character qualities that we talked about with Tony, he was beloved, et cetera, et cetera. So I think if you make a one-to-one -one connection of those two individuals, yeah. But at this point, to connect the current day Yankees with the 1927 Yankees, I think is really a stretch. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I think it's very hard. I th you know, the, the, uh, this is a very general baseball thought, but I, but I am a firm believer in it. The, the baseball, in, in, in many ways, either overt, overtly or, or indirectly, um, encourages one to make comparisons across eras. Yeah. And it seems like one can do it. And I think it's just a fallacy. It's, it's, uh, uh, I think you just need to enjoy Luke Voigt right now and not worry about comparing him to someone else or in, in, enjoy Tony Lazzari in his time and not worry about how would he do today. Um, right. And yet it seems like we have these reams of statistics and we have this incredible histories of which this, this the autobiography of Tony Lazzari is yet another one. Can't we just come up with some, uh, you know, absolute comparison across eras? And I think it's a, uh, it's a, a very dangerous game to play. Absolutely. <laughs> um, a question came in, uh, is there a comparison? And, uh, this one, I don't think I'm worried about the era, but in, in meaning, is there a comparison Lazari to Italian Americans, Hank Weinberg to Jewish Americans? Yeah, I think they both were, you know, the first great players of that ethnic group. Um, and they took, well, Greenberg, I know took a lot of abuse verbal abuses, did a lot of Italian ball players. Right. Um, I'm sure Tony got some, you know, when they were out of town visiting teams. Um, I'm sure the Dago and the WAP uh, came out. That, that happened even to Joe DiMaggio. And there's, uh, chronologically, there's a closer connection between Greenberg and DiMaggio than there is between Greenberg and Mazzari. But, you know, even Joe DiMaggio, coming along in 36, um, took a lot of abuse as any ethnic player in those days because of the way people looked at each other in a different way, judged you by your ethnicity, had certain terminology for each ethnic group that today you wouldn't see in print, but then were, as I said before, pretty common. So yeah, I think there's a, a, a strong parallel between as pioneers for your ethnic group between Greenberg and Lazari, for sure. Well, I think we'll take one last question here. And it, the reason I want to do it is because it's been asked by at least three different people. So I'll paraphrase. I'm not going to get the exact words for everybody. Right. But I think it, it, it goes to show that uh, you've made some progress here, Larry. You've really impressed people and you've impressed them. Uh, you've really uh, uh, made sure they... Uh, they're impressed by Tony Lazari as well. And that is, it's a speculation question, so it's a tough one, but what do you think it was? Why did it take so long for Tony Lazari to be recognized with, in baseball, the ultimate form of recognition, which is being voted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown? What, why so long? Well, that's a tricky question. I mean, what, the most obvious immediate answer is, given the period in which he played, and the fact that the Hall of Fame didn't open until 1939, um, when you started voting players into the Hall of Fame, there clearly was a certain group, in fact, nine, right, that went in the first time, who were unquestionably the all-time greats. But then you had a lot of other great players who had to be chosen, selected. So that took a lot of time. And at a certain point, if you're being judged by the baseball writers, your time on the ballot disappears. So if you don't get voted in, in a certain number of years, you're not going to make it. And again, because Lazari's career ended in uh, 37, 38, really, um, you know, he had a long list ahead of him. There are other speculations, too, that at a certain point, writers were reluctant to add more Yankees to the Hall of Fame because so many had already come in from that murderer's row crew and right. others, not to mention, you know, you had, you had uh, the manager, Miller Huggins, you had 
Ed Barrow, the general manager, Colonel Rupert, the owner, all these Italians are in the Hall of Fame in addition to the players, et cetera. So it's time, distance. And someone told me that the chances of getting into the Hall of Fame are much better if you're still alive. And Tony died at the age of 42 in 1946. So he's been off the radar screen for more than seven decades now. So he just kind of, I think, slid under the radar for a long time. And he was finally voted in in 91 by the Veterans Committee. And there are a couple of Yankee players on his team that got voted in before Tony, which in my humble opinion, and probably not objective, uh, he deserved to be in there much sooner than he was. Shirley Povich was the great writer for the Washington Post, Shirley Povich, male. Um, he was covering Lazeri in 20, from 26 on, writing for the Washington Post, but he followed Lazeri. He was on that selection committee and he thought it was appalling that it had taken so long for Lazeri to be voted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, this has been incredibly enjoyable. Uh, Tony Lazeri by Larry Baldessaro. I can't uh, uh, say it enough. Get the book, read the book, enjoy the book. And uh, it, it, like I said at the very beginning, you'll become a fan of Tony Lazeri's and you'll become a fan of, of uh, Larry Baldessaro. Larry, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you. Daniel. Hi. Um, thank you both. Thank you, Tom Siebert. Thank you, Lawrence Baldessaro. Uh, treasure to the Milwaukee community and the baseball community. Thank you again, um, Daniel. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everybody, for coming because we wouldn't have a bookstore virtual or otherwise. So we are open for browsing 12 to 6, soon 10 to 6, uh, without you. Um, hope to see you at another event. Thanks, everybody. All right.